and welcome into episode 83 of the Level Flight Podcast. My name is Connor. I've got Brian here with me today. Elliot wasn't able to make it, but we're holding it down. Brian, how you doing? Doing all right. Uh, you know, it may not have been conventional, but big win last night. Uh, we certainly have thoughts on it. Um, yeah. But no, I'm doing, I'm doing well. It's one of those wins where a lot of thoughts come from it because the Jets got dominated like thoroughly for the entirety of it. Um, I guess maybe not the first period, but let's let's get into it. The Jets defeating the Nashville Predators four to three in overtime, their fourth straight win. They're now two and zero on this road trip through Central Division opponents. The difficulty of those opponents going to get a lot harder on these next two games with Dallas and Colorado coming up. We'll get into that later on. Um, but Brian, this game last night, Jets, I'd say dominate the first period. Saros let in uh, three goals on five shots. Um, and then the Jets uh, kind of just fall asleep for the back 40. Connor Hellebuck, he's going to win the Vesna for a reason. Um, what did you see from this game, which saw the Jets sort of escape out of Music City with two points in a game that they really shouldn't have? I mean, for me, the the sole reason that they escaped is Connor Hellebuck, like truly. Um, Unbelievable performance. It, it was, it's... Like honestly, like it, w without him, I, I'd love to know what the score could be because, um, I I had to leave for a bit and then come back and I came back and I think when I checked the the shots were forty four to eighteen, um, yeah. and I'm like, I I don't know <laughs> what the final score would have been, but it would have been a clear cut victory for for Nashville. But I mean, yeah, to be honest with you, the the goaltending play and then like the quick goals in the first are the two things that I point to to sort of what went right and then there's a lot from in my head that went wrong yeah yeah and I just I, I want to talk because we talk about Velarde all the time we have to talk about his goal holy moly he tried this in the Calgary game I believe it was when he had a hat trick so clearly he was like feeling it uh in that game he was confident ended up with a hat trick he tried the between the legs it didn't work like it was saved um and then in this game he takes the puck at the side of the net, goes between the legs, and flips it bar down over the glove side of UC Soros to tie the game up at one. Um, this is why I had more faith in the power play turning things around than I do the penalty kill. Gabriel Velarde is... I, I saw, I believe it was Garrett Hole, who actually we're going to have on the, on the pod next week, so stay tuned for that. But he brought it up on Twitter, saying that Velarde at the side of the net is a cheat code that the Jets haven't had on their power play since line A on the left circle. And I have to agree. Like, at the side of the net, he's one of the best players in the entire NHL. Um, he makes not only, like, scoring plays, like he did on that first goal, but he makes passes to Monaghan. He makes backdoor passes to Cal Connor. Um, he draws people to him. He draws a crowd. He's unbelievable on that power play. What, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> that opening goal is just... A master class of hands from Gabe Velarde. Yeah, and like that's the thing. Like it's where it was so frustrating where there was no one who could fill that role when he was out. Um, and then that's why the Jets defaulted back to their failing power play strategy. Mm. And for me, like just having that constant threat down low makes it so much easier on everyone else. Like, even if Velarde's not scoring, if he's generating chances and you know, obviously he did score and he did go between his legs. Um, but even if he's not, the threat is there, which then makes it a little bit harder for whoever they're playing to defend it. And I'm like, that is precisely what you want from a power play. You have the extra man. That's the whole thing is if you can have a, a very dangerous, you know, bona fide threat somewhere, it's going to make it easier on everyone, like everyone else. And it also helps when that threat scores consistently as well so yeah and it's it's a threat from i don't i don't know if it's a high danger spot necessarily because there are times where a penalty kill can push him more to the corner um and and kind of nullify things but then if that's happening then monahan's open in the bumper or cal connor's open back door uh because he's drawing people to him in the corner it could be a low danger spot but it's gabe velarde so it's not low danger on the power play and then on this goal, when he goes between the legs and bar down, that's easily a high danger spot because he's in the crease, basically. Like, he's backing up into the crease um, as he's making his move. It's 
we're at the point where the power play, I'm not expecting it to like win the Jets a series, especially against Colorado, whose power play is top five in the NHL um, with Nathan McKinnon, Kel McCarr, Mika Rantanen, et cetera. Um, but they're at a point where if they get a power play in a game in the middle of the third period, they legitimately have a chance to like take the lead. Like there was a time this year where we were saying there's, there's going to be big power play moments in the playoffs and the Jets power play could just roll over and not, not generate anything, not score. And that could burn them. Now with Gabe Velarde back, Sean Monahan in the bumper, I think that there's a, a real argument to be made that during the playoffs, even against Colorado, if you get a big power play late or in overtime or something of that nature, Gabe Velarde is the kind of player with that man advantage that can go out and, and score that big goal and, and give your special teams kind of nullify the massive advantage that Colorado has in that area. Um, but yeah, Gabe Velarde with the, the gorgeous goal. Then the second goal was Tyler Toffoli making a nice pinch of the blue line, getting it to Mark Shifley, who ended up with a three point night. Nice to see out of 55. And then the third goal was Morgan bear in the fourth line again, making a nice pass to Dylan DeMello for his third of the year. Um, just a quick one on on maybe the fourth line. We talked about it a lot on LFP Live, but the fourth line, Shifley getting a three point night, like is that is that a sign of depth? Obviously, we we're not talking about the back forty minutes yet. I mean, we kind of talked about Hellebuck, but all in the first twenty, it was just a, a flurry of offense. It just felt kind of nice because there really didn't feel like there was any definitive plan from Nashville to stop whoever it was because if it was one, yeah. someone else. Uh, decided to come in and let's say like I don't I don't care if it's Dylan DeMello because he only has like what four goals in his last three years. Um yeah. you can't let a dude just walk into the slot like that. But no. clearly they didn't seemingly have a plan for how active he was going to be uh to jump in. You know the fourth line as we as you said we've talked about it a lot where if you can get any sort of production whether it's you know they're the ones feeding the blue and that sort of thing that's a bonus. Um, but no, like it, it's, it's nice to see, you know, early having all of the lines involved in what was being successful. For sure. And I do want to like, I, I want to preface this upcoming conversation by also saying that Cole Perfetti and Nikolai Ehlers both didn't play. I tweeted out last night, roughly the final 10 minutes of the game. Excuse me. Um, That'll be interesting to see because Tyler Toffoli made that play to Mark Shifley. Um, and I'm not saying, well, 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 Rick Bonus did do that actually a few games ago where Cole Perfetti made one pass to Nick Ehlers and he switched the lines. But I'm not saying um, that Tyler Toffoli should be playing with Mark Shifley because of that one play. But given the fact that Cole Perfetti, this was like a playoff environment, close day, game down the stretch and he didn't play, I wouldn't be shocked to see Tyler Toffoli up in that top six uh, next to Sean Monahan, maybe, or next to Mark Shifley, maybe, um, in place of Cole Perfetti starting on Thursday against Dallas. I don't know. I don't know about you because Nikolai Ehlers also didn't play the last 10 minutes, and then I don't think he's coming out of the lineup. Um, I also think, I, I don't know if you agree, but I think this was maybe Ehlers' worst game of the season or one of. He just, there are times where he's very chaotic um, to a fault. Like there are times where he's chaotic in a good way because he's generating chances and no one knows what he's doing and he's wide like players are just wide open in the slot. Um, and then there are times where in this game he's doing a spinning backhand pass in the neutral zone and Nashville takes it in and makes it one nothing. And it's like, well, that's a terrible start to the game. Ehlers, the turnovers didn't stop. That's why maybe he didn't play the last 10 minutes. I don't know. I think we have to be kind of impartial here on Nikolai Ehlers. We know. He's a zone entry king. He, we know we want him on the top line, but I don't know. He can be a lot better than he was on on uh, Tuesday night. Do you agree? Did you? Is that and you we and we know yeah. we know he can be better. We've seen it for the bulk mm -hmm. of his career, um, for sure. And that's the thing. My my issue with the the benchings um, doesn't stem from play. To be honest with you, like um, yeah, I think. Cole with Perfetti let, let in, like he was on the ice for the goals too. I think just to add more context, Ehlers, I thought had a terrible game. Perfetti, I think was on for both goals and was like kind of involved in both. 
uh, where Nashville tied the game. Or no, not the second one, because Connor Sheffield and Velarde were on the ice. So the, it was the yep. three-two goal, and he was kind of directly involved in that. Um, but yeah, that's why the players were benched theoretically. But go ahead. But no, like uh, that. The issue that I have is not in the fact that Ehlers and Perfetti mm-hmm. were benched for whatever the reasoning was. I don't. I don't care about the reasoning. Um, you know, if you feel it's necessary to do it, do it. Um, my issue with it is like, why is it always those two? Right? Like, when was the last time you saw any of the big names benched? When was the last time Neil Pionk rode pine for a while? Um, like w- the the selective accountability thing, uh, we've talked about it at length. Um, it's been a while since we've talked about it, but there was that conversation that was had a couple months back where Bonus had his long thing about how we can't just be giving guys ice time. And yeah. it came after, uh, you know, benchings and um, guys who were out of the lineup. And, you know, once again, not saying that Nikolai Ehlers didn't deserve to sit for a while, but in the last several months, why haven't we seen Kyle Connor or Mark Shifley, you know, take a few shifts off because they've just been awful in their own zone? Why haven't, uh, you know, they sat Neil Pionk for a few, few minutes because, um, Every game he gets worse by the looks of it. Um, and going down the stretch here, and I saw I saw a clip yesterday. I can't remember who posted it, but it was Pionk getting chased down in his own zone by the Preds fourth line, and the puck just ripped away from him. And then mm-hmm. they also posted it with the clip of what Nate McKinnon did last night against Minnesota twice, where he just came Nick- at them full speed and went past them. Um, and I just <laughs> my Nick thought Lino was if you posted that just oh Nick Line Nick posted that yes, um, yes. but yeah. But I'm just like, if you if you start on the road, if you're Colorado, you're like, I need to get McKinnon on the ice when Pionk is out there because there's no stopping him with that. Like, obviously, it's difficult for anyone, but like with how Pionk plays, like it's an absolute nightmare. Um, but my whole point with this is Pionk can make these unlimited errors. These uh, He takes awful penalties very regularly. He gives the puck away. He chases guys below. And to be honest with you, he is rewarded more than anything. He was double shifted in the third period. Um, yeah. He will regularly get bumped up to play with Josh Morrissey. Um, yeah. I, I don't understand why that can all happen. But obviously, as I said, Ehlers, bad game. And I, I get that. 100%. But there's been situations where he hasn't been all that bad. And he's still been sat perfetti for... Literally, there's been times where for literally no reason aside from bonus saying I don't like how he plays along the boards. Um, yeah, sitting him for the entirety of a period in a close game. Why are you only sitting those two guys, but the other guys who are very clearly struggling? Um, they get to just keep rolling and sometimes get rewarded for their bad play. I I agree with your point. Like. To say, um, uh, we're not sitting here saying that Ehlers and Perfetti had good games and they shouldn't have been benched. I 100% agree with the fact that they were benched. But what I don't agree with is the fact that over the six-game losing streak, um, like you said, Kyle Connor, Mark Shifley, who went invisible for a while there, uh, Neil Pionk, who has really, really struggled as of late. We've talked about it a lot on this podcast. Um, these guys haven't seen any limiting of ice time, not even a benching, nothing. Just same old, same old, and uh, and yeah, I mean, Cal Connor gets the overtime winner, so maybe. And I, I, I also think, just to add more, like up to date, uh, this conversation, uh, Kyle Connor, I thought has looked really good as of late over these last couple games. I don't know if that's a product of him being with Sean Monahan, um, or yeah, it's being away from I, Shifley. Maybe, maybe it's being away from Shifley. Yeah, but I thought he's looked a lot more explosive. Um, he's looking for a shot more. He had three assists in that Calgary game um, with Gabe Velarde. He set him up on that power play goal. It was really nice. Like, I think he's looking a lot better, um, and the Jets need him and Shifley going heading into the playoffs. Whether or not they can be going on the same line or on separate lines is a discussion we've had all too often on this podcast. Which um, Let's, so let's touch on to- it briefly. Yeah, like they okay, so they flipped them again, and Ehlers was benched and Perfetti. Um, so the the lines in the third period went back to Connor Shifley, Velarde, 
Ehlers, Monahan, Perfetti, which Ehlers and Perfetti got benched. So Monahan was just kind of like outside of Connor Sheffley Velarde, outside of Connor Sheffley Velarde, they were literally just doing next three at the gate. Go ahead. Like it was, it was pandemonium on the Jets bench in that third period. Um, and Connor Sheffley Velarde got shelled analytically. They gave up the 3 3 goal, but Shifley to Connor in overtime for the 4 3 win in three on three overtime. Incredibly offensively talented, gifted players um, got the job done there. At five on five, we've talked about it a lot. We don't think it works. There's a massive honestly. sample size that yeah. shows that it doesn't. Like, that's the thing. Like you've had that line together for well over 200 minutes, mm-hmm. and they have been statistically the worst line on this team all season. And we've it was a smaller sample size and listen we we didn't get a chance to really talk about it too much because we didn't uh put out an episode on uh monday or on tuesday Mm -hmm. um but there's been a lot of discourse the last two days about how um ehler shifley velarde wasn't doing enough um and they had been together for what two and a half games yeah what's what's the leash there like like what are yeah. we doing? Like the the, the, the lines that we had for six consecutive games, six consecutive losses, in which four of those you lost handily. What are we doing? Like, how can you possibly say, okay, we've had three games of these guys here where earlier in the season there's a track record that they did really, really well. They were still generating chances. Like it's not like they were just floating around out there doing nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then to go one game where there's a struggle from every single player on the team, there was maybe two guys, uh, that weren't awful. One of those is Connor Hellebuck, obviously. Yeah. But (laughs) you have a game where everyone sucks. It is a horrible game from everyone involved. And you say, okay, uh, that's, that's all they get. And to be honest with you, Flipping those guys, whether it's in game or in between games, to me signals that Bonus is not ready to let go what he thinks works on that line when everyone else can see that it doesn't. That should not be your I need to get an offense going line because they get absolutely shelled at all times. Yeah. And and it I, I don't know. Like they've won three straight games. The lines were working, not only the first line, but the second line. Um and look, they've got four games until the playoffs here. Like, you... <laughs> they, Connor if they, Lurie, if they roll into the playoffs with it, that's it. You're done. Well, th- it, I wouldn't even go that far. If they roll into Dallas tomorrow night with Connor Sheffy Vlardy and get rolled, then what? Like, you're, Another blowout? You're, you've got three games here. You've got four games until the playoffs. you got to figure something, some sort of configuration in the top six that works. Um... And there's, like we've said many, many times, there's this large sample size of Connor and Shifley not working together. Three on three overtime, not a thing in the playoffs. Great work on that overtime winner. Nice shot by Kyle Connor. You got the win. Game you really shouldn't have won. Connor Hellbuck was great. Um, But it'll be interesting to see how they start the game in Dallas because Nino Niederreiter is nearing a return. I would guess he's back Saturday against Colorado. Um, I'm sure Toffoli's going to be back up in the top six in place of Perfetti. Um, I also think Connor and Shifley are going to start together against Dallas. So we'll see. Um, they've won four straight games and, uh, we'll see if that continues on Thursday against Dallas. Um, we're going to take a break when we come back, we're going to take an, a, a larger look at the NHL as we're closing in on the playoffs here. We're going to look at the Art Ross race, which is picking up in a big way. Um, we're going to talk about who our MVPs are. We're going to talk about the Eastern conference wild card race, which is nuts. Um, Just a bunch of mediocre teams fighting it out. Um, And then, yeah, we're going to talk about that. There's also some news with the Arizona Coyotes. And then we're going to do a light preview of the Dallas Stars game on Thursday night um, and what we're looking for from the Jets. So stick around after this word from DraftKings, and we will be right back. We know hockey games move fast. But with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, you can score faster than anything happening on the ice. This week, new customers can bet 5 bucks and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app with code THPN. New customers bet $5 on the NHL and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. 
Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code THPN. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, licensee partner Golden Nugget Lake Charles. 21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. NHL and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2024. All rights reserved. And welcome back into episode 83 of the Level Flight Podcast. Brian, the Art Ross race is uh, is going to come down to the wire. I've got the numbers up here with me. Nikita Kucherov's at 139 points. Nathan McKinnon's at 137. And on LFP Live, we talked about McDavid. He's kind of fallen out of it. He's at 130, and he's actually scheduled to miss tonight's game against Vegas with a lower body injury. Um, that's like sources are saying he's going to miss the game. I believe he's actually a game time decision. Um, like he hasn't been ruled out yet, but I doubt he plays. Uh, they've made a they've clinched a playoff spot. They're it's their best player in the league, so I doubt he plays. Um, so I think it's between Kucherov and McKinnon, and. That also begs the question who your MVP is between those two. Um, I guess it's those two guys. You could throw McDavid in there. Matthews, if he hits 70 goals. Connor Hellebuck as well should be a heart candidate. Um, where are you at with both the Art Ross with the kind of the two-headed race there? And then who's your MVP uh, as we near the the end of the, the NHL regular season? See... I am on the same side for both of these. And you'll know as soon as I mention the the first name. Um, I think the Art Ross goes to Nate McKinnon. He had five points last night. Yeah. Or four points last night. Um, on And not only were they... Because he had a hat trick. But he was just... he The way he skates out there, it's... It's insane. He just blows Unfair. past guys like they've ne- like yeah. he's like he's skating against Timbits hockey players. It's like insane. Um, I also have McKinnon as my heart trophy pick because, yeah. to be honest with you, like obviously the, the Tampa Bay Tampa Bay Lightning are not the Tampa Bay Lightning of their cup winning years of 2019, mm-hmm. 2020. They're still a deeper team than what Colorado is, for sure. Like they, they still have enough offensive firepower in that lineup where they don't need Kucherov to go off for 139 points um cuz they've built up a nice little gap but I do I do still think I think it's it's that he's going to score a lot anyways but the fact that he's leading the league in points for me is not enough to put him ahead of McKinnon in my my heart trophy race the, the best argument I think for Kucherov is the fact that the next closest guy in Tampa Bay is like 50 points behind where for Colorado, it's not. I don't think it's that big of a gap. I think Miko Rantanen um, is up there. I believe Kale McCarr is nearing ninety points as well on the blue line. Um, so Kucherov is is really racking up the points, driving that offense. He's one of the best power play players in the league. Um, is that enough to win the heart? I'm not really sure. I think I agree with you though. The Avalanche depth we're going to talk about it a lot over these next couple weeks because the Jets are going to be playing Nathan McKinnon and the Colorado Avalanche in the first round um but their goaltending is spotty their depth is not that good um they have Kale McCarr they have Devon Taves and they have some they picked up Sean Walker Casey Middlestat but I'm still just not moved by their bottom nine up front and their defense core outside of Kale McCarr in general like I think Nathan McKinnon putting up 137 points and having them in contention for the one seed in the Central this deep into the season until they lost that game to Dallas on Sunday night um, is incredibly impressive. Tampa Bay is going to make the playoffs as well, but they're not going to be like a like fighting for the one seed in their division. They're at 95 points. They're pretty locked into a wild card spot. The Leafs are going to finish ahead of them. They're six points ahead of them right now. So Tampa Bay is going to be a wild card team. Uh, Kucherov put up a ton of points. Drag them to that spot, but I think Nathan McKinnon dragging 
bad depth and bad goaltending to the number two seed in the central uh, and a hundred plus point team and a team that was fighting for first in the central this deep into the year, I think is, is more impressive than what Kucherov has done. So I'm with you on that. Whether or not McKinnon wins the Art Ross, I don't, I don't really, that, that doesn't change anything for me in terms of heart stuff. Like, look, these guys are two points apart with like four games to go each, like whatever. Um, I think McKinnon it should be the heart. Uh, does Matthews, if he hits seventy goals, move the needle for you? At 100%. all, in terms of, I mean, I, he's. I don't. I don't yeah. think he's my heart trophy pick, regardless. Yeah. Um. But I think, I, for me, he's like. Obviously, he's not up there in points, but mm. doing what he's doing. Is something that hasn't been done in close to no. twenty years. Yeah. Um. Because last time that anyone scored this many goals was Ovi in the mid to late 2000s and yeah no one's touched 65 since um yeah. like stamkos did it in 2011 where he got up above 60 but matthews is really the only one now who can reasonably do it all the time by the looks of it um yeah. i just doing that for me is score I, I still think scoring goals in the nhl is the hardest thing you could possibly do and the most valuable thing you can do um yeah People seem to point to, oh, the scoring's up, you know, such and such. But I'm like, yeah, but who else is scoring close to 70? No, no one. Yeah. And he's got 66 with four games left. So he needs to go in every game. Scoring bunches. Yes. If he gets like a hat trick tomorrow night against the Devils or something, like it's it's going to be Which, it's gonna be there. I want to mention this too, because I mentioned his name. Oh, we set another record last night. Because mm, his yeah. last little hot streak got him to 30 goals. Um, yeah. That is the 18th season of 30 or more for him, which is the most in NHL history. Unreal. Unreal. Yeah. It, it's crazy. He's he's the greatest goal scorer of all time. And I, I have yep. no uh, no issues saying that. Um, the second wildcard spot, speaking of Alexander Ovechkin, in the Eastern Conference, we've got the Capitals, the Penguins, and Detroit all within a point of one another, each with four games remaining. Philly is done. Uh, they just lost like 9-3 to Montreal last night or something. They're, they've got an extra game played, and they're behind in points, so I can't see them making it in. Uh, the Islanders look pretty locked into that third spot in the Metro as well. Um, unless, yeah, Washington and Pittsburgh could both catch them, but I think the Islanders um, are in that spot. Just quick, who do you think between Washington, Pittsburgh, Detroit – finishes as the wild card spot in the east um and who do you think like not deserves it the most but who do you think if they were given that spot would have the best chance in the first round to win that series see my heart says pittsburgh's gonna sneak in because i just want to see crosby get another playoff Me too. Me series too. just because he can just do things that i have loved watching um yeah. my my brain though is telling me that it's probably going to be washington because down the stretch here, whenever they need to win games, they seem to do it. Um, I've been following yeah. the uh, the wings fairly closely uh, because of a friend of the show, Rebel, a uh, big wings fan, but he lives in DC. So he <laughs> gets to kind of watch this thing going on and constantly he's like, Washington, I need you to lose. And then Washington will win. And then he's just, you know, frustrated for weeks. Yeah. But they've been, it seems like they've been playing each other a lot recently. Mm -hmm. um, and I know recently that the Caps, you know, sn snuck ahead of them, and but I'm like, no, nah, I, I think as much as I like, I would like to see Detroit get some playoff experience. Um, I don't think it happens this year, uh, mm -hmm. and I think Washington's that team that uh, that sort of inches everyone out there. And uh, uh, okay, I I'm gonna go with Pittsburgh. Um, and honestly, tomorrow night is is the deal breaker. Pittsburgh versus Detroit, 6 p.m. Um, if you're looking for a game to watch, maybe the first period before the Jets game starts, or high. tune into that one. That's a playoff game, like straight up, because whoever loses that game, you're not making the playoffs. Like, I'm sorry, but you can't lose unless it goes to overtime and someone gets a loser point. You can't lose in regulation to a team you're chasing directly with four games left in the year and then make it up. Uh, the odds of that are very slim. So I'm going to be tuning into that game. Might have to get the, the dual screen set up because that, like I said, it's a playoff game. Um, might need a third screen to see if Matthews can get 70 goals and, and yeah. up that chase. And then 
the Jets game, of course, which we're over the 30 minute mark or nearing it. Um, let's talk about this Stars game. The Jets have been unable to beat the Stars this year. They're 0 3 against them. The latest game against the Stars was in Dallas, where, if you remember correctly, Dallas basically jumped out to a 3 0 lead uh, early in the first period. The Jets came out super flat. Um, and then the game was just kind of going through the motions from that point forward. I think the final score was 4-1 for Dallas. Um, but it, everyone knew, like, the first period, they were just, they were toast. Like, they came out flat. Dallas was all over them. Dallas is one of the best teams in the NHL over the past month. Uh, they're 9-1-0 in their last 10 games. The Jets 4-5-1. and But the Jets have won four straight games. You see, like, they lost six, and now they've won four. So, um I know we talked about the lines. So without talking about the lines, what are you looking for um, tomorrow night for the Jets or tonight when you're hearing this against Dallas? Uh, for me, I'm just looking for if the fact, like if they can actually get any sort of momentum to start, because mm -hmm. as we've seen um, in, I think in almost every game that the Jets have played against the stars this year, they suck in the first, like they just, it's yeah. just brutal. And then the game's over. Because Dallas does a really good job of locking things down. Um, and yeah. I truly think that if the Jets go down even by like a goal or two, uh, game's over in the first before you're leaving gets going. Just based on how good Dallas is as a team. Uh, I can yeah. only assume that we're getting Jake Ottinger, um, who has been yeah. on a insanely good streak here. Um, yeah. And then, I mean, the rest of the team, you just look at the roster. They're just insanely good. And they are, you know, Love really it. clicking. They were kind of like middling for a little bit there right after the, de the deadline. Everyone's like, oh, maybe it's not going to help. And then they clicked and now they just, they look dominant and, um, you know, handled uh, Edmonton, handled uh, yeah. Colorado. Oh. Um, and I mean, to be honest with you, I am, I don't want to sound too much of a pessimist, but I have a feeling that the Jets are going to get handled. I mean, that's what Dallas does though. Like, I, yeah, it's, it's. These next two games, the Jets have to win one of them, I'd say. Like, in terms of just, like, confidence heading into the playoffs so you can beat a really good team on the road, um, you got to beat one of Dallas, Colorado. We'll do a preview of the um, – oh, wait, I guess we're not having an episode between now and the Colorado game. But that's obviously, like, a first round. We'll do a post game. <laughs> we will do basically a post game um, with LFP Live Sunday morning. Um, but that is basically a first round preview because – Everyone knows those two teams are playing one another. I think the Jets have to win one of these two games. They have to look the part against these two teams because that's what – we're four games left. Uh, this is who you're playing in the playoffs. This is who you're going to have to beat if you want to win a Stanley Cup. Um, so really interesting games to watch for here. But, yeah, I think Dallas, like, they're my cup pick. And they were we – They weren't for a while, on. but now they are. Yeah, they, we had Jacob Stoller on. Um, after the trade deadline when they picked up Chris Tanev um, and we basically were like, who do we think is going to make the cup final? And all three of us, I think said like Dallas, Florida or uh, Elliot, I think said Dallas, New York. Um, and I think like Dallas is just so loaded from top to bottom. And I think even when they weren't clicking, we all picked Dallas and now they are clicking. Jake Ottinger looks great. They're 50 win team. They might win the president's trophy. Um, them and the Rangers are right up there. So I, I think they're my they're my cup final pick in the West for sure. And uh, against a New York in the finals or against a, a Florida, I would take Dallas in that series. So, yeah, I think you're seeing uh, the cup the cup finalists or the cup winners uh, tonight when the Jets take on the Stars. And then you're seeing a first-round preview um, when the Jets take on the Avs at 3 p.m. on Saturday. Join us for LFP Live number nine. Um the Andrew Kopp edition of LFP. No, I don't know. The Evander Kane. Um, <laughs> Alex uh, yes, yes. Well, you, we should go current day first. That's a good point. Um, but join us for that regardless. Sunday at 9 a.m. Um, like always, hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell so you get notified when we do go live. Um, and we will be breaking down these two games against Dallas and Colorado. Two massive games. Um, and maybe the Coyotes answered. are moving to Salt Lake City. <laughs> right. We said we wanted to maybe, maybe that by Sunday. Who knows? Maybe by Sunday. Um, yeah, maybe we'll talk about that more on LFP Live. Um, we'll break yeah. down the two games. We'll do some NHL-wide stuff. We'll talk about the, the Salt Lake City situation with the Coyotes. Um, so join us for that. And from Brian, Elliot, and I, we really appreciate you listening. And we will see you Sunday morning. Enjoy the games this week, everyone. 
and join us Sunday. See you.